we now turn to our first speaker on the opposition, Lucas Mordu. Lucas is a second year undergraduate student. Order, please. Thank you. Lucas is a second year undergraduate student reading economics at St. Catherine's College. They won the right to speak through open audition. Lucas, the floor is yours. Thank you, Mr. President. Ooh, is this on? Okay. So I'd just like to begin um, my speech with a small anecdote from Freshers Week, um, where I was over dinner, I was having a conversation with some flatmates. Um, and inevitably, as Cambridge students do, we were talking about each other's subjects. And when it came to talk about economics, one of my flatmates told me that she believed that economics as a subject has brought no good to the modern world. It hasn't helped us. And this put me in a deep sense of shock, and it made me question the raison d'etre for the subject that I study and love. And in particular, it made me think about two things. Firstly, why do we do economics? And then secondly, how is our public understanding and perception of economics around us framed? I think this is particularly important when that distrust of economics and economists goes far beyond my roommate and far beyond Cambridge students in general. I think answering these two questions should give us an idea of why we shouldn't prioritise economic growth above everything else. So firstly, for me, why I do economics is a fairly simple answer. We do economics to raise standards of living. We do economics to make people's lives better. Our focus in economic policy should be about promoting and prioritising this. And secondly, our main public understanding of how we do this is through growth. And however much Sam might have said he's not about GDP fetishization, unfortunately, how we measure growth in our modern society is about GDP. That's the value of production in goods and services in an economy over a year. Whatever we do, that is how we understand growth. That is how we measure growth. And it's not just a measure, because one, it's one of the few economic statistics that is widely circulated by the media, that is widely in use in the press, and it's widely in the public lingo. So GDP is not just a focus of priority, it has become a national obsession. And we can see this with the most recent news on how we narrowly avoided a recession last year. And so I think that means we have several, we need to be really careful about how we treat GDP and how we treat our approach to GDP. And so I'm going to outline several problems with GDP and why we should be careful about that from here. So first, very quickly, I'm going to do a little part on the climate crisis. I know other speakers will cover that a little bit more in depth later on. But I think one of the big issues with GDP is how our measure and our understanding of growth does not take into the account the fact that we continually destroy the climate and natural capital. It's a massive issue. And so I think rather than having a measure of growth that is focused on production, we should transition towards a more asset-based measure of growth, where we measure growth in a way that still keeps an idea of how much we produce, still keeps an idea of our material well-being, but it also takes into account the value and the necessity to protect our climate and nature around us. Now, this would all be already pretty bad if our understanding of growth, that is GDP, worked as an accurate measure of individual welfare. However, the problem with that is that GDP as a measure of welfare is imperfect, and it should not be something we prioritise above all else. Don't get me wrong, this is not an anti-growth speech. I am a very pro-growth person, and I think that GDP doesn't do a bad job on predicting and forecasting economic health, pros aggregate prosperity. But the problem is, like many aggregate statistics, it misses out so much, and it misses out too much that we should prioritise it above all else. And I think to understand this, it's important to understand GDP's history. The concept started in the 17th, 18th century, and it started as a measure of a country's ability to wage war, not as a measure of welfare. The modern measure of GDP originates from the Great Depression, and from its onset, its architect Simon Kuznets warned the US Congress, no less, against its use as a measure of welfare. So why on earth are we focusing entirely on GDP to measure how well off we are? And so in that sort of sense, GDP is inevitably going to measure, fail to measure a lot of stuff. One key element, GDP fails to measure unpaid labour. That is domestic and care work done within the confines of the home. There's the famous adage that GDP would to go down if you were to marry your cleaning person because they would be doing your cleaning house and you wouldn't have to pay them. And so the problem is that domestic and unpaid care work 
is valued at roughly 70% of GDP in the UK by the OECD. And that is work that is overwhelmingly done by women, roughly about 70%, according to the IPPR. And that's where I have to thank Arya Babu's Twitter account, because I wouldn't have realised that otherwise. And it's not just what GDP fails to measure. It's also what GDP hides. There are massive issues about how GDP conceals poverty. Take from 2010 to 2019, we had 10 years of uninterrupted growth in this country. It was one of the largest periods in which we grew year on year without a recession. Our economy grew in real GDP terms by 22.2%. That is an enormous amount. Yet during the same period, the child poverty rate rose by about 10%, from 27% to 30%. That meant 400,000 more children in poverty. Total poverty, at best, was constant. So it's no surprise that the UN released a report emphasising the, dis the disgrace that a growing, dynamic, innovative economy like the UK, which at the time of the report in 2018 was the world's fifth largest, had poverty at the extent that we do. And so it is sort of sobering when recent GDP news about avoiding the recession that we did last year was released, the current Conservative government's social media flared up about the success of the government, how well economic policy had been done to avoid recession, whilst conveniently forgetting that during the same period, millions are struggling with the cost of living crisis, millions have to choose between whether they heat their homes or whether they eat properly that night. And it's a problem that is only growing despite a GDP figure not properly revealing that. The problem is the Conservative government also forgot to mention that this problem was due to their own economic mismanagement. And its problem with GDP concealing poverty is not just an issue in the UK, it's across the world. UK, if anything, is a better example of how GDP measures welfare. Let's go to Angola. In purchasing parity terms, GDP per capita there was $7.8,000. Yet 70% of the Angolan population lives on less than $3.2 per day. In South Africa, the figures were $20,600 and 57% on less than $5.5 a day. In Qatar, one of the richest countries and most developed economies in the world, that figure was $113,700, 2.4 times per capita GDP of the UK. Yet Qatar has 2 million migrant workers, of which the majority live in absolute squalor. And so we can see through this that quality of growth matters, not just quantity. And this is something Kuznets warned about us again. And unfortunately, the obsession with growth that we have in this country and with so much of the world means that we continually miss on the quality of growth. We continually focus on how much we grow. And this is something I've been able to see with my own experience. I'm Speaker's Office for the Marshall Society, which is the university's economic society. And a current consistent theme with every single economist I've talked to is about how our focus and obsession with growth has led to policies that continually promote London at the expense of the rest of the country, which means we have got a situation where we've got one part of the gro country growing and the rest of it in perpetual decline. And unfortunately, it will take a long time to get out of that cycle. And yet, this is not just about, our obsession with growth does not just hurt stuff that GDP hides, it also hurts how we grow. Britain currently has some of the lowest growth in Europe and the G20. The IMF expects Britain to be the only major economy to shrink this year, even behind san sanction-stricken Russia. And why is this? This is because of how governments have consistently undermined and providing an obsession about economic growth. The trust government's uh, mini-budget was only about trying to kickstart the economy in an obsessive way. And so we see... Yes? I think some of it was. If you look at people like Jacob Rees-Mogg, some of the key architects and argument, uh, people in, in favour of Brexit, one of their key arguments was that leaving the EU would unshackle and would free up how we negotiate our trade policy, allowing us greater access to the world. And so I think I've talked enough about the, economy, the econ economics of it all, because the harm of obsessing and focusing solely on growth above everything else goes beyond the economy. And it might surprise you to hear an economics student say this, but there is more to life than economics. Because 
focusing on growth devalues everything worthy of passion, fun, joy, and enjoyment. It devalues music, it devalues literature, it devalues sport, sport, all of which give us reason to be proud and happy of our lives and of our country. We lose sight of culture, we lose sight of our history. Just because something doesn't directly contribute to growth doesn't mean it isn't good for society, doesn't mean it isn't worthy of our time, and it doesn't mean it isn't valuable in our lives. And yet Tory plans, up until very recently, were to slash funding of arts by roughly arts education by roughly 50% under Gavin Williamson. Because, and I quote, they weren't strategic priorities. A society that does not value the arts, culture, history is a dying society, and our current obsession with growth is doing just that. So, to conclude, our understanding of growth is almost entirely through GDP, and it's a figure that misses out on far too much to be subject to such obsession. It's not surprising, though, given its origins as a measure, to, to, as a measure of industrial and warfare capacity. I'm on my conclusion, so no. So I'm going to begin by finishing up with a quote from Robert Kennedy. GDP measures everything except that which makes life worthwhile. It does not allow for the health of our children, the quality of their education, or the joy of their play. So I believe that we need a healthier relationship with growth, a more holistic approach to welfare and well-being, one that can actually be felt by those who need it the most in our country. So for these reasons, I implore the House to oppose the motion before it tonight. Thank you.